so we are here at the open source leadership summit at the beautiful town of Sonoma, California. What are we doing inside? We should be outside, right? I know. <laughs> the weather is so good. So awesome, yeah. yeah. It was actually raining in the morning. I was I was planning to do interviews outside when it was raining, so yeah. I moved inside. But l let's not get all into <laughs> there. Uh, so first of all, Nithya, I mean, I have known you forever. Yes. But just for the sake of our audience, can you yeah. quickly introduce yourself? I, I'm happy to. So um, Nithya Ruff, and I'm the head of open source uh, practice at Comcast which is at the intersection of media and technology, and uh, we are a well-known company in the U.S. Um, I'm also, I also sit on the board of the Linux Foundation as a member at large or a director at large, which means that I'm not representing a company, but I'm representing the community. Uh, so what is your role at Comcast? So my role at Comcast is uh, to lead the open source practice for the company. Mm -hmm. What that means is to more systematically and in a scalable fashion uh, introduce open source culture and open source engagement uh, inside the company. So Comcast for a very long time has been working with open source. Uh, even before I came, which was about a year and a half ago, Comcast uh, created an open source project called the Apache Traffic Control Server. Um, they have contributed things like Speedtest.js and numerous uh, projects to open source, but it was uh, happening organically and part-time, you know, with lots of people getting involved. And uh, we felt as a company that we had reached a, a tipping point where we needed uh, a focused office which would develop competency around open source in the company and transform the company uh, in terms of open innovation. You mentioned a couple of you know uh, projects that uh, Comcast has been. So is it that they they created these projects and then open source them? Or, and in addition to these you know projects, are, are you also involved with other open source projects? Absolutely. Um, we created the Apache Traffic Control mm -hmm. uh, Server, which is a a content distribution network. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, uh, we looked in the market for something similar, and we found some proprietary products but they didn't quite have the functionality we needed. Mm -hmm. So a number of years ago, we decided to create uh, our own and we open sourced it and then we contributed it to the Apache Foundation. Okay. And uh, it's been incubating at the Apache Foundation and it has more than just Comcast as contributors. Right. Um, and we also use that in our production. So okay. it's, it's something that comes back inside the company. Another area that we created a project, for example, was it's called the Reference Design Kit, mm -hmm. or RDK. Mm -hmm. um, many people have set up boxes in their homes and also routers, which help them get high-speed internet from Comcast, as well as uh, the cable services. Mm -hmm. um, what's inside those boxes is um, the open source software uh, which we've created called the RDK Kit. Mm -hmm. um, so we created a project called the RDK Project and many, many members of the cable industry are members as well as OEMs, as well as SOC vendors like Intel and Broadcom. Mm -hmm. And this really revolutionized the way set-up boxes and customer premise equipment was created. In the old days, it used to be very proprietary. It took a very long time to update it or introduce new features. Mm -hmm. And then it, you know, people would throw it over the wall, right? The SOC vendor would create their BSV or SDK, and then that would go to the OEM, who'd then create the box, and then would come to ISVs. Uh, we've completely changed that process to a, be a very nimble and agile process because everyone's working on the same software code. Mm -hmm. Those are two really good examples of projects that Comcast created, which really changed, you know, pieces of that industry. Uh, in terms of projects we depend upon or are involved in, um, we clearly consume a ton of different projects, right, in open source. Everything from big data to AI to uh, networking projects to cloud projects. A couple of examples of projects we consume and are very involved in are Cloud Foundry, mm -hmm. which sits under the Linux Foundation umbrella as well. Uh, we use I think that. these days everything sits under a Linux Foundation. Exactly, it seems that way. Yes. Uh, because it's a good home. It's a good and, home. And uh, so Cloud Foundry, we are very, very involved in that. Greg Otto, who's our executive director in that space, plus his team, 
use it to, to um, help developers inside the company uh, to be able to deploy their applications very, very quickly. We also use the Yocto project, uh, which is an embedded Linux project under the Linux Foundation umbrella. Mm -hmm. And that's the foundation, if you will, and the build system for our RDK project. So it allows us to use a common build system across from SOC vendors all the way down the supply chain to collect all of the uh, you know packages that are needed to create a set-top box. A couple of other uh, projects, clearly we use a lot of Apache Foundation projects like Spark and Cassandra. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, are also now members of the CNCF project. Um, what else do we open chain from a compliance perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we use OpenStack inside the company uh, for some private cloud work um, and tons of tools. Uh, we are a huge GitHub shop mm -hmm. and um, we have one of the largest uh, GitHub installations, I think. You're using a lot of open source you know, technology. At the same time, your developers are contributing to a lot of projects. Uh, while it's all open source, you know, compliance and licensing becomes a big issue. So what kind of processes are there within Comcast to kind of, you know, empower developers so that they can freely, you know, either use or contribute to the... And that's a very, very good question because to me, compliance means that you respect the license that the developer developed the uh, software from. And we get a lot of benefits and privileges in using open source software. So we feel that we need to abide by uh, some of the obligations that come with the license as well. And my team is responsible for compliance in the company. But even before my team was formed, it was our legal team actually mm -hmm. who created an open source advisory council. Okay. They were very forward looking. Um, they created uh, this council whose job it was to define policies and also to approve any requests for contributions that came inside the company. The challenge was that uh, it wasn't scaling fast enough um, with the amount of requests we were getting as a company. And so legal was constantly getting requests directly from developers. And one of the benefits of having an open source program office, as you know, is that we act as uh, an advocate for developers and we act as a first line of uh, support, if you will, for developers. So what we've done as a team is we've automated the entire process of requesting for contribution. So people just have to go to Jira, fill out a form, and they say, I want to either uh, upstream some bug fix or patch, or they say, I have a brand new project I've created, I want to uh, put that into um, the open source. And then um, my compliance manager basically approves things online if it's a very small contribution. If it isn't, she sets up a meeting with the legal team, engineering team, all at the table. And we do a 20 minute review of the developer's request. He or she will describe the request to us. Mm -hmm. And once they leave, uh, we immediately, uh, as a team in a closed meeting, we say, is this something we want to approve? It's approved, and then we send them instructions for how to set up their project. So it's as quick as that. And just to give you some stats, we try to uh, do a quick turnaround within 10 days if it's a major project. Uh, if it is a patch or bug fix, it happens almost immediately. As soon as they file, we can approve it. 96% of everything people submit, we approve. Mm -hmm. So we're not throttling back or holding back. Um, and uh, the process has improved so much that from 2013, when we had only 13 requests for contribution, mm -hmm. to now we got 110, 115 requests last year. Uh, throughout the year? Or, uh, throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Which isn't uh, you know much compared to, say, an Intel or yes. others, but uh, in our line of business, you know, Intel needs to prepare a software ecosystem prior to chip arrival. In our you know, ecosystem, it's not as uh, critical. How do you encourage your developers to actually go out and you know participate in more open source projects? And you know, without uh, this process is, I think you know, when you're officially using a Comcast ID, then you have to go through this process. But other than that, you know, that they can freely come to these events like that, or you know, just engage with the community. How do you do? You have anything to encourage? And, uh, Absolutely. And then just one more comment on the compliance process because it's relevant to mm -hmm. this question is. Uh, the philosophy we've taken is that 
we want to reduce friction mm -hmm. to engagement with open source, whether you're contributing or consuming. And we also don't want to be the end of line inspection. We mm -hmm. want to uh, help them build it into their daily thinking. Right. Just like DevSecOps, you can call it DevSec Open Ops or something. Yeah, you right? can as many, uh, yeah. many, many inserts into yes. that uh, phrase. Um, so the Zen, the, the approach is to guide, mentor, encourage, uh, create an environment where they feel that uh, the company cares. So one example of how we encourage people to get involved in open source is most companies in their technical ladder for uh, becoming a fellow or distinguished engineer generally go by the number of patents filed or papers published. So we this year and last year we changed it to also say, is this person now being accepted into an open source project? Is, has he become a maintainer? Has he mm -hmm. open sourced something? Is he being invited to be a speaker? Um, or she being invited to be a speaker? So we are acknowledging open source contributions as part of the promotion for an engineer. Um, we are trying to do a rotation program in the Open Source Advisory Council where engineers can come and sit on the council as one of the approvers so that they can get trained in open source thinking. How do you balance business and open source? How do you balance IP and open? Mm -hmm. We uh, encourage, we constantly post call for papers for different conferences on our Slack channels so that people can go out and speak about their projects. We have an ambassador program, which means that there's uh, open source uh, advocates throughout the company in different locations uh, can join us and be part of the open source uh, practice and be the eyes and ears in that location and, and go evangelize open source in that location, be a point of contact for you know people. That allows us to scale also as an OSB because we're just three of us and we're a three woman office by the way. Whoa. <laughs> so we run uh, almost a 10,000 developer you know, uh, organization which is our technology um, and customer experience and uh, product uh, group. Um, the last thing I'll say is we've just made it so easy. We have a central uh, site where all information is hosted okay. um, for open source and they can you know, go see it, go uh, kind of check it out. It? You know, uh, things like our policies, okay. uh, conference calendars, okay. Okay. Uh, who to contact for questions, and then we help them write blogs, mm -hmm. we help them promote their community. Uh, we help them brand their project with icons and stickers and you know all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we are a full service shop from compliance all the way to community strategy to uh, marketing and yeah, awesome. guidance. Um, you mentioned Spark. So uh, these days machine learning is a very interesting use case. Uh, and uh, so in what capacity is you know, Comcast you know, kind of using uh, machine learning? Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. The, the group that I uh, sit in is called Technology, Product, and Customer Experience. Mm -hmm. So customers are at the heart of everything we do. Mm -hmm. And yes, we have a long way to go to transform our customer experience, so we take that very, very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways you transform customer experience is using AI. Mm -hmm. It's um, in, in a number of ways. One is uh, in reliability and in predictive maintenance and making sure that we reduce the number of truck rolls uh, and that we catch problems before they happen. So we use that in our customer support uh, you know, analysis. The second is in how we transform uh, how you uh, search for content on your set-top box, how you use the content, um, recommendations, that sort of thing. So we're making, uh, I don't know if you've used the voice remote, the X1 voice remote has transformed the way customers are now viewing their content on their Xfinity box. So instead of having to memorize all the different channels and which channel to go yeah, to I and keep Com surfing. Yeah, I, I have Comcast, so I, though, but I prefer app more because I am like more mobile than yes. sitting for TV, but yeah, I have. <coughs> the voice remote? Yes, I have used it, yeah. But. It's, it's, it's completely changed uh, people's experience because you can now say 
Uh, I want to watch Game of Thrones. You're not worried about bad AI, but what if you say, I want to watch Game of Thrones and the AI say, no, you cannot watch it right now. <laughs> well, uh, Or you just call them and say, no, your line is fine. And no, I, we, we don't take we have over, heard, right? Yeah, we have heard and, so many yeah. stories with Alexa and everybody, so you That's never right. know. Yeah. You cannot trust AI too much. No, I mean, we, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but uh, so it, it helps us uh, improve customer experience. Um, through training it on voice uh, mm -hmm. recognition, on natural language, uh, phrases that customers mm -hmm. use, etc. Um, and, and so we're constantly kind of looking at the data and seeing how we can refine and make the experience better. So customer support is one area, this is another area. The third is in our home security product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, really doing visual recognition right. and alarms and That's more alerts. like IoT also, right? That it is IoT, mm -hmm. exactly. It's cameras in the house, right. plus um, you know, being able to act uh, on data at the edge rather than coming back to the cloud right. and making decisions and event-driven uh, actions. In addition to these, uh, does machine learning also, because when you're running the software, you know, it can also help, help in monitoring and scanning and you know, finding bugs you know, and all the other patterns we're seeking. Do you also use machine learning other layer of the stack to make the software itself smart, not just the user experience? I, I think the teams do, mm -hmm. and uh, I have not uh -huh. uh, asked them about. Yeah. Uh, but there's potential, you know, there's, yes. uh, there's so much scope of machine That's learning right. everywhere. Yeah. One of the key partners I work with, uh, and my team works with in the open source uh, arena, is our AI team. Mm -hmm. Um, the AI team is based out of DC, by the way. Okay. And uh, Jan Newman and, and his team work very closely with us. Um, they also are open sourcing their models and they are do publishing research. Uh, they're working with UC Berkeley and other organizations, universities on uh, training their models and you know learning. And we are also competing for talent, just like everybody mm -hmm. else in the AI space. So. I'll, I'll send you a URL with uh, all of our AI information aggregated in one place. Uh, when you talk on machine learning, and you also mentioned, you know, open, how much the uh, are you using a lot of like Spark other uh, machine learning, or you're also you know developing your own and then open sourcing them? I think both. Mm -hmm. uh, like everybody else, their uh, AI is ripe for mm -hmm. collaboration, and uh, uh, the whole workflow in AI also is is being worked through. Uh, constantly, you know, how do you kind of uh, uh, develop these models? How do you train the models? How do you uh, use them in your products, mm -hmm. etc.? So we do use. Uh, I couldn't name some of the projects for you. I'm sure we use TensorFlow. Yeah, and and we open source also. So we just. Uh, I actually yesterday or day before we just approved open sourcing a model for our AI team, okay. and they were thrilled uh, because. Uh, you know, you, you really learn uh, these models need more data to learn. And uh, so by open sourcing, we can collaborate with others. Comcast is doing so much open source. Uh, how, how, I mean, why and how important is open source? Not only for the Comcast, you know, but I mean, you have been in the open source world for so long. Uh, how Since 98, this yeah. is my 20th anniversary. Exactly. So. Just like the OSI. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I should make stickers exactly. saying 20 so I, years in open source. So I can put it here, yeah. <laughs> uh, so how important is open source today? Um, I, I cannot think of a single industry that's not being uh, changed. Exactly. Right? Uh -huh. so, and, and the words are so good, what Andreessen said, software is eating the world, and open source is the way they're eating you know, mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. It's the utensils for eating the world or whatever. Right. right? Because most of the innovation is happening in open source. Right. Um, most of the time to market can be achieved especially for companies that have typically not been software companies, mm -hmm. the only way to leapfrog and get time advantage is by starting with an existing set of components that are already well worked and well done. And, and the skill set is there. Right? People are coming out of college or you can hire good people. Yes, there's a shortage, but um, you know, developers look for that. In, in companies they want to join. So if you are a company that's going through digital transformation, if you want to leapfrog, if you want to innovate uh, and get competitive advantage or hire good people, you've got to use open source software. Mm -hmm. So it's a business imperative, it's a must do for innovation. 
so I'm always surprised when people ask me, why Comcast and open source? I say, why not? Mm -hmm, exactly. Right? Because we are really an innovator. Um, we are doing a lot of work, whether it's in the cloud and the networks, all the way to embedded devices and IoT, and running the world's largest IP network and uh, you know streaming content to millions of homes. That takes a lot of technical savviness and know-how. Yeah, I mean, as you said, you know, today, you, if you're not a, you, you book any company, you have to be a technology or software company. Yes. You, you want, whether you're Airbnb or you right? know, you're dealing with hotels or cars, you know, you have to be. Even if I'm a jewelry maker yes, yes. or making uh, clothing, I, if I want to run a successful business, I need to need it, yeah. know how to use it for my advantage. Right. Yeah. And the second layer now is that it has to be open source. So you have to be an open yes. source company, simple, yes. you know, just yes. cut the software part. Yeah. I, rem I remember an interview with Sam Ranji, you know, when he was still at Cloud Foundry, and he said that, and I asked, he said, you know, in a couple of years, we will not even be using the term open source anymore yes. because software will it's just kind a component. of, it will become, you know, that software means yeah. open, open source. source. So you won't. It's ubiquitous. Yeah. And we are slowly moving towards in that direction. That's you know, right. If you look at today, it's, is actually not a question that who is doing web pesos, the question is who is, who not, is not. Who is not doing it. And why not? Why not? Yeah. You know, it's just not. Yeah. There are some cases, very, very, but those cases will, you know, either they are unique cases or they'll fade out, you know, in time. They will eventually. Uh, uh, I also learned that uh, Comcast is joining CNCF. You're already a member of Linux Foundation, right? So what is. Why, why CNCF? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're babies, yeah. right? Yeah. But CNCF, the momentum is amazing, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, right? All three cloud Kubernetes vendors. Kubernetes is the biggest, you know, after Linux, you know. After Linux. Linux. Yeah. And uh, we, we found that a number of our teams were using Kubernetes mm -hmm. throughout the company. We are contributing to Kubernetes. Uh, we're using Prometheus um, and a bunch of other components in CNCF. And we were lucky to have Sarah Novotny and Chris Anaschek come to Comcast last year. We do an open source conference twice a year in the company. You don't invite me? It's mostly an internal conference, yeah. but um, we particularly wanted to invite the CNCF team. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's an area that everybody is using to mm -hmm. hasten application right. deployment, right? Because we, we create a lot of apps in the company, uh, whether it's mobile apps or apps that sit on your set-top box or on your high-speed internet or in the home. Uh, from a security perspective, and CNCF helps us do it faster, cheaper, right. better, uh, more effectively manage our cloud apps, manage our container apps. Uh, so we, we feel uh, very strongly about uh, working closely with Kubernetes. And what do must CNCF enable you to make it cheaper? Uh I think it's just managing our app oh, deployment. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. You meant Kubernetes or CNCF? Kubernetes, Kubernetes yeah. right? Okay. Which is which is one of the crown jewels I, yeah, of the CNCF. Kind of yeah, it's it is, uh, I use it interchangeably because yeah. it has it's a portfolio of projects. Right. Now it's like become an umbrella where you can That's right. shoving a lot of projects under. The CNCF. other thing that I like is that all of the cloud providers, the public cloud providers, support CNCF. And Who doesn't? They're, was that right? question, is that? And they're providing services, um, Kubernetes as a service mm -hmm. and other things. And we uh, consume public cloud. And mm -hmm. so it's nice to be a part of a project and influence or work with the cloud providers on extensions that we right. may need or customizations we may need in one place. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think we talked, touch upon a lot of broad topics. Is yeah. there anything else that you think that I missed? There's one more thing I, I, I want to say is, you know that I've also worked a lot in I was diversity about, I, and I, I inclusion you know and open was source. To, I, was, I don't know why this skipped my mind, but I was uh, about was, to ask. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm, it's... When you mentioned, you know, that you had three women controlling the whole world, that's, that's the kind of world we should be living in, actually. It would be a much <laughs> better, peaceful world. Anyway, but... This is such a fabulous team, and then on this International Women's Day, I am so proud of my team. Uh, these are uh, two fabulous individuals who um, single-handedly are helping us transform the culture. Um, they are service-oriented. They, they take ownership. They take accountability for what they do. Um, and you know, you're only as good as your team. So mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to work with Krista Kare and Sheila Saibi, who are part of my team. Um, I also work, as you know, in the Linux Foundation and elsewhere on 
supporting opening doors to open source and I continue to do that and Comcast uh, has been ex incredibly supportive of me uh, continuing to you know do both of these uh, work and they sometimes go hand in hand mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to continue to do that work. Uh, Chasing Grace is another project that I've been involved in and I'm part of. I'm you invest with Jennifer Clore? With Jennifer Clore yeah. and uh, Wicked uh, Flix. Wicked, Wicked Flix, yeah. And I sit on the board of another organization called Code Chicks, mm -hmm. uh, where we are helping women in engineering continue to stay in engineering through investing in their development, providing safe spaces for them to support each other and talk to each other. So I, I feel like I, my life is so rich and complete because I get to do you know what I love and I get paid to do what I love. Exactly, yeah. Somebody's yeah. paying for your hobby, right? Yes. Yes. That's why you don't feel like you're working here, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nitya, for your Thank time. You. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think we learned a lot about Comcast today. Thank you. Thank I'm you glad so much. Uh, for the opportunity to share uh, what we're doing. And I'm happy to have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.